have come here to tell you my life story. Today, I am 74 years, seven months, <laughs> and seven days. And you now want me to encapsulate all this <laughs> nicely in 18 minutes. That is a tall order. However, what I think I would do is to quickly give you a whistle-stop tour of my life and uh, based on some of the ideologies I developed over time, which you can say culminated in making long-term bets. It's not easy to come to that conclusion, but eventually, after several mistakes, trying to short circuit the system, be short-termism, short-termism, and looking for the low-hanging fruits to exploit, you find that these things don't last. And that the best, the best thing that you can ever do is to make sure that the best you take are long-term, not necessarily for self-aggrandizement or for self-utilization, but as a service to others, because once others are satisfied, you will never lose. You will never lose. Another thing I want to tell you is this. If you, the only thing I, I think you can take away this evening, and that is, if you, by any chance, believe that I have done well, each and every one of you has the capacity to do better. And I think that's one to be good. I was born in Oweri. I'm giving you my age. I went to school in Oweri, went to secondary school in Oweri, came here, did my A levels, had a first degree in London School of Economics, then City University for postgraduate studies. My first work was in a consulting group in a company called Metra Consulting Group with offices in East Croydon. Then from there, I went to National Economic Development Office. And um, if you know Milbank Towers, my office used to be on the 14th floor. Then from there, I went to Greater London Council where I worked as an econometrician doing the forecasting of shop floor space and employment demand. After that, I moved to Uganda. When I moved to Uganda, it was a strategic move. But before I moved to Uganda, I made my first strategic bet, long term. And that is this woman. <laughs> You will be surprised. I never proposed to her. We were good friends. We could sit talking for hours on the telephone. We loved going to listen to operas and classical music. And then one day, I called her, I said, we are getting married. <laughs> And I told, her, I told her the date of our marriage, and he told me, but I haven't told my, my sister, I haven't done this. I said, my sis is coming, and she knows everything. And that's what happened. 
I won't mention her again, but one thing. If ever I did anything that is good, she was contributory to it. If I did anything bad, she had not, no part in it. <laughs> I can tell you why. It is either I didn't want to tell her, or when I told her, using the woman's sixth sense, she didn't agree with it. And those things invariably have gone wrong. So that's her. <laughs> now, when I went to Uganda, we were to stay a long time. We were there as part of a consulting group that was doing economic studies for Ugandan government. My own job there was to do, try, attempt to do an input-output model for Uganda. However, this was truncated. What truncated it was Idi Amin's coup. Now, how did it happen? On the 25th of January, 1971, my wife and I went to a place called Jinja. Are there any Ugandans here? OK, good. <laughs> when you go to Uganda, you have three good things. The th first three words I learned was Matoki, Waragi, and Somaki. <laughs> and when we went to Jinja, immediately we came, to Jinja, came back in the evening, the morning which is the 25th of January, I was waiting for my driver to come and take me from Kampala to Entebbe for a meeting. And as I was pacing the ground, the, my driver's name was Oswald. My wife was saying, maybe Oswald didn't, because he came back late, maybe he didn't wake up early. So what happened? Oswald didn't come. Who came? Ricardo Mazzucchelli, Uncle Mario, not aunt. And then she said, what are you doing here? Don't you know what has happened? I said, why? He said, there has been a coup. You can't stay here. Why couldn't I stay there? Because opposite me was the Inspector General of Police. The Ugandans who are here know where Nakasero Hill is in Kampala. Then few, five minutes was Obete's house. So that was a sensitive area. So we left, they drove me out, and we went to Kololo. And in Kololo, they, we didn't know that Amin's headquarters was in Kololo. And then, <laughs> in a long, cut a long story short, I left. But when I got to Uganda on the 4th of September 1971, sorry, got to Nigeria, 4th of September 1971, I was you know, in a difficult situation because I went to stay with my sister, with my two children, and uh, it was a three-bedroom house, one single toilet bathroom, one fridge, and I was given an honorable position. They allocated one of the three bedrooms to me and my son. Very small room, small bed. So, believe it or not, my children slept on the bed and I slept on the floor and that was fantastic because my back pains started <laughs> going. So, now, in Nigeria, two things happened. I tried to find a job, I couldn't get a job. So. I decided to do something. What did I decide to do? I decided to set up a company. Since nobody wants to employ me, let me employ myself. <laughs> so I set up a consulting, because that's what I know of, consultancy. So I set up a consulting group called African Development Consulting Group, mirroring the company I went to work for in Uganda, African States Consulting Organization. So, certain things started happening in, in, in you know, sequence. My wife got a job with the United Nations and World Bank uh, office, in uh, information office in Ikoi. A friend of mine, a cousin actually, asked me to 
write a features article. This was the time a Deba Award was uh, announced. I wrote, I told him I don't know anything about a Deba Award, but let me write something which I call the background to a Deba Award. That features article which I did created some sort of uh, attention for me because nobody knew who I was coming all the way into a country of mine where I never walked and nobody knew me. So why were they interested? Because I queried some of the notions that were current in those days. One was that we can develop using import substitution as a policy for industrialization. I queried it. I queried the neglect of agriculture in preference for oil. And then I also forecast that there was going to be shortage of food in the country at a particular date. Did this things come through? Yes. If you can recall, there were times we now had what you call essential commodities. Anyway, ADCG, which was the name of the consulting I did, helped me a lot. As a matter of fact, ADCG was the auspices from which we set up Diamond Bank. Now, and it's also helped me to know a lot of people and the story from there, I went to know people. It wasn't an easy thing, but it did work. Now, let me go quickly to Diamond Bank because it's interesting. And I'm going to tell you, when we set up Diamond Bank, three issues were at stake, the challenges, finding the shareholders, those who would be shareholders, finding, getting the approval for license, and working, getting the payment for the... I'm going to read you a, a, a quick letter, because time is going, but this quick letter will show you, I wrote this letter in 1990 to the shareholders. One of the things I did, which nobody believed me when I said I wanted to set a bank up, was that don't tell me, don't give me any money, tell me how much money you would put eventually when we get the license. And of course, some of my friends said, this man must be mad. But it turned out that I wasn't. <laughs> because I was focused to the finish. You see, when you say focus, I say focus to the finish. Because you must look at the various angles or some of the things you know, that could happen. What could go wrong, then you mitigate against it. Now, quickly, this was a letter which I wrote to one of the people. I said, 18 January. As you are aware, February 1990 will be exactly two years since the Central Bank asked us to pay for the minimum share capital required for the bank. Initially, when we were first asked to pay, the required capital was 10 million. That was February 1988. Now it is 20 million. Now, we couldn't find it. 20 million naira in those days. The purpose of this letter is to inform you that a long time has elapsed without any positive reaction from you. I have been bearing all the brunt without any help from anybody. I'm, ready, I'm really tired of the nonchalant attitude being displayed by everyone, <laughs> and I can't take it any longer. <laughs> if your share payment in full is not received on or before February 28, 1990, Underlined, I will take it that you are no longer interested in the project and will by 1st of March 1990 remove your name from the list of would-be subscribers. Sincerely yours, Pascal G. Dozi. Now, I think if you think through this, you can see the problem of setting up the bank. The bank has been set up. It blazed the trail. Because one of the things we wanted to achieve is to set up a bank that is technologically based. We took initiatives that, strategic initiatives that fundamentally blazed the trail and 
change the banking landscape. What did we do? We started what we call Diamond Integrated Banking System, which means that you can, um, you can bank anywhere. Just, we call it one bank bank, one branch bank. So if you can deposit money in one branch, let's say in Abba, you can come to Lagos and take your money. So there was no such thing before. Then we started online transfer, which means you can transfer money from Kano to Lagos without any hindrance. Even working customers could do that. Then we started the first debit card called Diamond, Diamond Card, Diamond Pay Card. And you know what it is now. Everybody is carrying a, either a credit card or Technology is easy to emulate. And therefore, once you set up all these things, it was not long before most Nigerian banks started doing the same, which made it. At one point in time, I came to London here, I tried to get a transfer from, and I was surprised that they didn't have the same system where we are more advanced in banking and technology now some, this was in 1990s, than some banks in this country. And I told them so. <laughs> but more importantly, what I call the soft, the soft issue, the soft infrastructure, we had what we had called Diamond Code of Ethics. Diamond Code of Ethics, which was more or less the philosophical of underpinning of anything we, we did. And it did, apart from that also, we had our dress code. So if you saw any Diamond Bank uh, staff, you would know he's a Diamond, or she is a Diamond. Now, let me talk about MTN. You know the truth about MTN the biggest tel telco in Nigeria, but it wasn't easy to set up. Eventually, it was set up. You see me as the chairman of MTN, that was by God's design. Because when we were doing the bidding, a lot of people, one of the, one of the, one of the issues in the bidding is that we are told anybody who is seen in two of the, two, more than one consortium, bidding for the license they should be thrown out. That group should be thrown out of the bidding. Now, during that time, some friends of mine whom I invited to be part of the system thought it wise to publicize my name on the pages of newspaper, putting me in various consortiums. And then the MTN people came one day and wrote me a letter and said, we don't want to see you again. Please seize any, if, there, if you have any of our uh, correspondences or documents, please bring it. I never replied them. Because, and they said because I was seen to be double backing other consortiums. Eventually, one day, they came to my office and said, we want to see you. I said, why? I thought you said we don't have anything to do with me. They said, no, we have found out that you were being friend. Now, is there a takeaway on that? So, mind, mind your neighbors. Now, <clears throat> what other things we have to, I can tell you? Let's, you see, one of the things that did well for us in Nigeria was that there were, during this time, several people who had the interests of Nigeria at heart. 
and who are willing to work for the improvement of investment climate. People like uh, Dick Kramer, people like N.S. Shoneko, and we, through, with, uh, through N.S. Shoneko, we had the um, Nigerian Economic Summit Group under Babangida. That Economic Summit Group helped in improving the environment because through the auspices of that group, the Indigenization Decree Act was repealed. The Foreign Exchange Act of 1962 was also repealed. These two acts opened up Nigeria for business. It wasn't the politicians, it was private sector. So you can see, they say, a rising tide leaves all boats. None of us went there to ask for import license or a waiver. And like the minister was saying, we aren't asking for a waiver. All we did was to create an advocacy group that had to um, work for Nigeria. And when we were working, it was a, an organization that had no high table. Every table there was a work table. So, <clears throat> and everything we did was long term. It was this group that helped in getting the Lagos Business School established. It was this group that helped in setting up the ACA, the prime private equity capital, private equity company in Nigeria, the first, and the, <clears throat> which had, first fund was 50 million, but we, we were able to get $35 million. It returned 15 times its money. The second fund, the third fund, now we are managing $750 million fund and still counting. <clears throat> what I think I would like you to take away also, and that was what really made us do our work. It was faith, faith in our country, faith and love, and don't be selfish in your design, whatever you want to do. And secondly, let me put it this way, that the path which you people are going to take from now on will influence to a long, I mean to a very <clears throat> considerable measure the future of Nigeria. So don't think that you cannot do anything. Don't come back to Nigeria to make money. Come back to Nigeria to add value. <laughs> now, <clears throat> my time is up, but I want to tell you a story. <laughs> a story of three minutes. Sorry, it will be less than two. Have you heard of Monsanto? Monsanto. It's a major company, isn't it? Yeah. Good. Monsanto, at the 75th anniversary of the establishment, wrote a book called Faith, Hope, and $10,000. The man, Monsanto, was the name of his wife. His, he had faith in himself. His friends had faith in him, and they could generate only $10,000. So they started business, and his, the rest is history. When can you come and establish your own Monsanto at all? When? Because you can do it. But you must have friends and have a teamwork, that's what it, I'm trying to say, a teamwork where you don't have a hidden eye. Because in the spelling of team, there is no eye. But you can have 
eye in it, hidden. So everybody <laughs> must everybody must walk on the walk table, no high table. I went to America. I was invited to to Washington to talk to a group like you, and I made a passionate plea to them to come back. Today I was speaking to one of those people. I said, Nicholas Okoye, okay, that's my name. I said, Nick, I'm going to mention your name I'm in this gathering. I said, should I? I'm just taking leave. I said, why not? It is the truth. He has come home. He didn't find it easy, just that I, as I didn't find it easy, but now he's doing well. When you are coming to Nigeria, cross your Rubicon, burn your boots, come and add value. Thank you.